welcome back to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show, and you are? Well, if you're watching us live, half of you are saying there's a herky-jerky uh, thing happening on the visual, and the other half is saying it's fine. What's the matter with you? So if you are of the half, as my own computer here is showing me, where I'm doing some bad Max Headroom uh, rigmarole, apologies thereabouts. And for those of you who are downloading us after the fact, apparently not a problem. So the professional thing would have probably been to say nothing, but for the people who are watching like me, there's guess, nothing more you know aggravating me, than this. I'm a this. big fan of living in ignorance, so it's just, you know, <laughs> don't. Yeah. Just don't so you would have been happy in the Matrix. This is I not, yeah, you would have been yeah. thrilled in the Matrix. Take right. the pill, are you kidding? Very well. uh, all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we just, uh, I should mention, this is our first time going live in HD. <laughs> Wait, that's not 3D, it's HD. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no difference. No, we just look worse. <laughs> yeah. No, it's all the pores that are the problem. Um, something tells me the uh, HD is going to force me to do audio only. I'm going to go to a strictly audio podcast. That's what looking at the HD. Uh, although, I might have to, have to worry about it because I've never actually watched the show. Um, I'm very, very excited to be back, and if I do a header into the desk during the show, just understand that I started this morning in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I am on caffeine. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but here's the thing. That's not even fair. Why would I fuck with you now, of all times, when there's uh, crazy herky-jerky things going on? I thought you were actually buffering in real life <laughs> because of the jet lag. You were, you were worried for me? I thought you were having, you were having some sort of aneurysm. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it was just... Phase we were, one. Phase one. <laughs> before the header. And then you smell toast. <laughs> and then it's is? all over. Because I've smelled toast all day. All day. Is it toast? <laughs> is that what we're looking for? Is I, think, I think that's the go-to smell. <laughs> For that, the go-to. Um, it is the first week of June <laughs> when we are going out live. This means we've reached the midway point of the year. I think that's July first. Well, no, <laughs> I disagree. Right. It's Ex month six, so sure. at the end of the six month, one could argue would be yes. the exact middle. I, I, I'm with Sam. <laughs> July first, by most people's accounting, but go on. Yeah. I'm curious. Are you, or are you including Smarch? <laughs> I'm including Smarch. That's exactly what Saved happened. Saved by Jamie. Yeah. Saved by Smarch. Because if you include Smarch. Well, that was for Smarch more, weather. You can stay for one more week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll save, the, I'll save the questions for a month from now. Please. When we don't have a 4th of July show. No. Um, we have July 10th, and then we must have a third. No, there'll be no show, unless there's a pre-tape. I might have to take this up in the last show of June. Very well. Very well. Wait until then for these questions about what it's like to be at the midpoint of the year. Um, as we reflect back on the first five and a half months of the year, Sammy, what are your feelings so far in 2011? Oh, man, so much has happened. Uh, I got my hair cut. Uh -huh. uh, you went to Paris with your future ex-wife. How dare you say <laughs> any of those things out loud? Uh, yes, yes, I went to Paris. It was wonderful. This is so far, it's a great year. I have no complaints about 2011. Come on. None what's We got Bin Laden. What more do you need? Yeah, I was just, I was, I couldn't help but go and do a little bit of that. I was in North Carolina doing some stand-up shows. Yeah. And I, it dawned on me, there's no way to beat him. Uh, and no way to beat Obama. I don't even know why the Republicans, they should just phone it in from Norway. Just mm -hmm. forget it. Go mm -hmm. on vacation, let it go. Even in the debates. Uh, Mr. President, you have exactly 90 seconds to rebuttal the question that the economy is still in the shitter. 90 seconds. And then Obama says, uh, I got Bin Laden. That's true. Next question. Yeah, then he does some <laughs> death jam poetry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just blows everyone out of the water. Come on. It's amazing. <laughs> Forget and whatever the question, I think we got Bin Laden, right? Yeah. Didn't that happen on my watch? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. No? We shot him in the eye like Mo Green from The Godfather. Right. Uh-huh. One of my, they had, uh, I think I mentioned this before, when they had all the memes come out, the internet memes about yes. uh, Bin Laden, and the best one was, because in the same week, it was like, I showed you my birth certificate, I got Bin Laden, what, what else do you fucking want from me? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really was. Uh, that, oh, I, I'm, I'm really sad about Trump not being in the race, though. I really, really, really 
liked him being in the race. I liked it too, but not as much as I like Sarah Palin getting into this race. Well, but that's we've seen this movie too. I hope and pray for that every mm -hmm. night. I hope and pray to Gambler. If you're a Republican, you've just got to be beating your head against the wall saying, is this all we've got? Come on. I Somebody. Okay, it's either going to be her. Mitt. Or Mitt. Mitt. <laughs> um, I, I, the reason I wanted Trump to win mm. the presidency. Mm -hmm. The presidency, uh, not yeah. the nomination. No, 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 the presidency. The presidency. <laughs> wow, okay. And I voted for it's Obama. Yeah. Let's be clear, but, Oprah right. told me to, and I'm not stupid. Very well. I know who the true leader is. Yep. But I wanted Trump to win because I'd like the, us to have a Kim Jong-il. Oh, right. Why can't we have the crazy motherfucker <laughs> dressed in a unitard? But he's not going to, he doesn't, uh, he's not going to, like, produce a ballet. <laughs> he's not going to write an opera. He's not? No. Okay. No, he doesn't do any of that stuff. Good point. He, he's, he has writers who do all that. He's... Kim Jong-il, he is multi. Yeah, he's very, very talented. multi hyphen yeah. Kim Jong-il. Oh, man. Hey, look, I got him to produce his birth certificate. What do you want from me? And by the way, he might have killed a kid. Um, <laughs> Wait, what? There, is that, was that the interesting I heard, stuff? I heard things. You might have was killed. that the stuff? Because <laughs> yeah. he kept saying, my, my researchers are finding incredible stuff in Hawaii. Right. You're not going to believe what they're finding. Here's the birth certificate. Well, all right, I guess they didn't find. Well, what was that exciting stuff? Ah, it doesn't matter. No, 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 no. <laughs> you said they're finding incredible stuff. Give us even a hint. I'd rather not. So you were just you were just lying. I think I answered your question. I don't he, think you did. That meant, was a real back and forth at a yeah. press conference, by the way. I think he really meant there was some rundown property in Waikiki <laughs> that, that the Trump could take over. I don't know. We we're losing James. Something's happening in the room. Jay Mackovich sent me the meme. I don't know if they could pull it up, oh. but I forgot that Obama has a cowboy hat on. Uh, he does have a cowboy hat on. Can you guys throw that up, please? <laughs> Okay, it's coming. <laughs> this, this is killing me. Here it comes. Wow, we got very political here. Here's my here birth certificate. Here's Osama bin Laden. Anything else I can do for you, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> it's, the it's the hat. It really is the uh, tip of the hat. Yeehaw! Oh. <laughs> All right. And, you're, and, and yet, we're still not at the middle of the year. Nope. All that. All that. It's two, 2011, man. Shaping up to be a real one for the, one for the books. Mm. Mm -hmm. The books. Um... All right, well, I think we have an ask, a couple of Ask Kevins from the viewers. If you'd like to ha have any questions uh, answered by any of us, not just me here on the show, write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. This first one comes from the obsolete man. At Kevin Pollock, I see you're in Indy at Crackers Comedy in a couple of weeks. Are you going to do the Bob and, at Bob and Tom show while in town? Um... Yes, yes, and yes. Oh, wow. I love the Bob and Tom. They've launched, they've been so great to comedians um, over the years. It's a morning radio show, for those of you not familiar, all throughout the middle part of the country, but like in 140 markets. Yeah, Twice they're, they're syndicated big time. Howard Stern went at the top of his terrestrial career. Um, so, yeah, they're amazing. They've launched great careers, not mine, but um, they've been very... I, I love Bob and Tom. And the marsupials thing became like the third most requested in the history of the show, which was absurd. But now it's a t-shirt on my website. Frankenstein never scared me. Marsupials do. Because they're fast. I think our guest today worked with Christopher Walken. I believe in the dossier. They did something together. I'm going to get to the bottom of that. Yeah, you're right. Because right. no, there are no better stories than the Christopher Walken stories, even if they're made up. I, I can't get enough. <laughs> So, yes, yeah, see you at Crackers. One of the worst names of a comedy club ever. Uh, Dana Gould that. has the best name. <laughs> Uncle Fuck's Chuckle Hutch. <laughs> I don't know how you, I, you, could, you can't. You don't even forget. <laughs> don't, even, don't even submit. Can't touch that. Can't touch it. Next, ask Kevin. It's from uh, Bruno Santos. I feel like these names are familiar. Hi, I couldn't help but notice you didn't finish last week's story about the ACP. The ACP? The uh, Academy of Cock Police. <laughs> that can't be it, Sammy. No, no, no. I've gotten a lot of letters from them, mailings, what? their newsletter. I know they're a guild. I didn't know they were an academy. <laughs> it's an There's academy also now. an academy? An academy. Almighty oh. Cruise Pen. It's oh, being clarified. Shit. I am thinking of something oh, else. Oh, I thought he just forgot a couple of letters and it was the NAACP. <laughs> yes, the story about the NAACP. <laughs> You mentioned a couple of noteworthy events, and right through to the end, when you were going to say, 
what happened after the ACP, the almighty cruise pen, ran out of ink? You got interrupted by the guest. Yeah, that happens because it's a conversation. So once and for all, how does the story end, Kevin? Too bad they don't sell those anymore. No, it's not too bad. Why would I want anyone else to have the almighty cruise pen, which it's now uh, referred to? It's not a Mont Blanc. For those of you, a couple of people uh, tweeted me saying, hey, is it this Mont Blanc? No. It's from Barney's. It originally was sold at Barney's only, yes, when, uh, when the Master Cruise... Uh, Past. I'm trying to remember people. This was like 20 years ago. Exactly 20 years ago, <laughs> 1991. No, seriously, it was about, yeah. No, it was 1991. It was 20 years yeah. ago. Um, so the end of the story is the pen ran out of ink, the pens. They went on the mantle. I lost one, and then I lost the other, and then in a recent move, found them both. They resurfaced, oh, They resurfaced, will. found them both. I think wow. Negrin may have taken one of them. Negrin was no. sitting on one. Okay. And he hadn't taken it. He would come over the house and he would sit on it. He brought and it wait back. for us to go, where's the pen? <laughs> Did he bring it back? No, he never took it. He was smart. He just would come over and sit on it and make us think that it was gone. Right. <laughs> Here's what I think. Here's yeah. what I think. I yeah. think he had it for a while. Yeah. He saw you guys were getting suspicious. Brought it back one day. Sat over. What is this? Oh, wait a minute. How long has that been there? It hasn't been in my apartment for eight months. No, that's yours. I've been using this to lure chicks back no. to my apartment. Do you want to see the pen Tom Cruise no. came? It used to be, I'll show you my etchings. Now it's the Tom Cruise pen. <laughs> Um, and then Emily, God bless her, went online and found the ink because I had gone to th three different uh, specialty stationery stores in town that s uh, literally, like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, when you see all those crates, <laughs> they claim to have that many ink uh, cartridges to choose from, none of which fit the key to the almighty cruise pen until Emily found them and now they both both of them work and that's the end of the story it's rather uneventful tell it again but that is the end <laughs> wait till next Christmas when I tell the story again is that gold from a DC-7 <laughs> nice <laughs> come on nice come on I think they were DC-10s were they DC-7s I don't know what do I know <laughs> JMX says DC-8 great <laughs> right. Great. I uh, will see your seven. Yeah. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Santos, for forcing me to tell the end of that story. And uh, really, it was just so that Emily could get some uh, little pat on the back, and we could discover. Uh, and we can make fun of Negrin, and which Negrin is what it all comes sitting, around sitting to. Sitting on the pen. Yeah. This. Oh. Oh. The games. The games. They continue. Get. All right. Now it's time for Larry King game. Did we do the graphic? We've run out of graphics. We did. Did we not do Ask Kevin? We didn't. Do I didn't hear the song. No, I didn't hear it either. Ask right, Kevin. Do we? No audio. <laughs> <laughs> no audio. I want to remind everyone: it's our first voyage in HD. We're going to blame everything on that. Isn't it my understanding most of our uh, downloads go audio only? Um, many of it. We have. Many audio only downloads. Right? When you say the majority, when you say the month the of December when we had a million two hundred sixty five thousand, are you suggesting that a million one hundred thousand were in fact audio only? I'm I guess I am suggesting you that. would be underrating. It's actually more than that. So to those folks, I will say, ask Kevin. And Thank they can you. pretend that that ran over the graphic. They're letting us know that there was audio. Um, the chat room but, heard it. But we didn't hear it. <laughs> Sammy didn't hear it, so let's let's start over. Can we do the show from the Seventeen top? minutes in. Our guest has been so patient. We're going to start over. All right, it's time for Larry King game. We got a winner this week um, who sadly has written in from Mexico City where I will not be sending a T-shirt. Do you know how much it would cost? $74. Also, the likelihood that it would actually get to its recipient, <laughs> slim to none. If, uh, if Jeff in Mexico City is watching or listening and you hear tell that I've used your Larry King game and you would like to lay claim to this T-shirt, write to us again at contact at .com and let us know what relative you have in the United States of America or I can send the T-shirt and then they can get it to you. Can I send it to the Mexico Pavilion at Epcot? Or if you'd like to go to the Mexico, <laughs> Mexico Pavilion at Epcot, it'll be waiting for you at booth 12. <laughs> right next to the uh, three caballeros, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> now, the Larry King game from Jeff in Mexico City. <clears throat> in light of my forthcoming retirement, a certain funny man has come out of the woodwork directing at me a game of unwarranted pot shots. And no, not the kind that Barry Goldwater and I passed around backstage at a Dean Martin roast. Anyway, this funny man calls himself a professional, 
and thinks he can pull off some cockamamie impersonations despite his high-pitched, nasally voice saying things like, I'm buffering, and I'm a pod chat. He then concludes his show with a hor horrible impression of yours truly and a jab at small-town America that sounds something like this. I'm Larry King, and I can count on both hands the number of male genitalia that I've handled. Let's go to the phones. Rochdale, Indiana, you're on. Quite frankly, I'm appalled by the direction in which journalism in this country is turning. Let's take a call. Rochdale, Indiana, go ahead. <laughs> nice effort. Wow. All the way from Mexico City. Wow. And a three-act play. I was that is... <laughs> that went on a bit. That is something of a novel. Yes. Or a novel approach. All right, <laughs> there's our winner. Let us know if you want to stop by Epcot Center. Oh, this is the thing that I had when I was watching the scary thing, the, uh, the, the monster scary thing that Elaine and Mike and them do. Super scary. Yeah, the super scary thing. When you have an iMac, a power, uh, Mac computer, apparently the, the HD is going to be herky-jerky. Oh. I take umbrage with this nonsense. Take it up with Steve Jobs. You didn't pay enough. Didn't pay enough. All right. That's what it is. Thank you for all your participation, everyone. And those of you watching on a Mac computer, apparently, uh, we should all go fuck ourselves. Martha's yelling at you. She's using all caps. She said, it's not herky-jerky, Kevin. God. Oh, Martha. And that's Martha. Oh, wow. well, she's not using a Mac, apparently. Ask her if she's using a Mac. Um, to my uh, guest today, uh, I'm unbelievably excited because... Um, We've had character actors on the show before. You know that I'm a big fan of my brethren and sisterin in the world of the character actor, where we get to um, don as many uh, coats and hats and masks as possible, as humanly possible. Uh, this particular gentleman today I've been a fan of uh, for a very, very long time. Um, I'm not going to say whether my fanship actually goes back to, where is it? Wait for it. Wait for it. A 1983 television pilot called Cocaine and Blue Eyes. But I am curious <laughs> if he has any insight as to a show with that title did not get picked up to series. Please welcome Stephen Tobolowsky. Um, that show. Cocaine and Blue Eyes. Cocaine and Blue Eyes actually featured the great O.J. Simpson. Stop it. No, yes. <laughs> as the star, and he was the first big star uh. I met in Hollywood. I was so excited to meet the Jews, because he was still part of the human race at that point in time. <laughs> and I remember, I played, I've done this many times, I played a porno store owner. Sure. And uh, a lot of times, if you look at my resume, you'll see a lot of roles that don't really have names. They just have either job descriptions or uh, locality, man from Texas, something right. like that. But in this, I played a porn store owner. And I remember I went up and met him, and he was sitting in his Hawaiian shirt, and I said, Mr. Simpson, I'm so happy to meet you. I loved watching you. My father loved you when you were at USC. Very charming. We went in, and we rehearsed our uh, porn store scene. Uh -huh. And then I went out, and uh, I was significantly taller than the juice. Yes. Juice was like about six, and I was like 6'3". Right. When we went back to shoot the scene, Juice was taller than I was. What the? And they spent two hours building the floor up, so when we did the scene, I would be somewhat diminutive to the juice. So uh, that was my first experience. Clue number one, Clue that number Colonel one. Mustard was sharpening <laughs> his knives. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that movie was so, it was so bad. Was it a movie? It was a, that was back in the era in which they did made-for-TV movies. Oh, right, right. I don't right. think they do that anymore. Yeah, I think it, it, it might have been a backdoor pilot as may, well. May have been, I yeah. don't know. But the, uh, it was so bad that the one time they aired it was on... New Year's Eve evening, <laughs> where like no one, no one would see this. It was terrible. Well, that yeah. was their version of dropping the ball. Right? But <laughs> had, had you had seen me in that show, you may have been a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty good. Um, I'm sure. Um, well, first of all, happy belated birthday. Oh, thank Just you. Just last week. Thank you, yes. Uh, yeah, I and crossed a major threshold. Well, is that something you want to talk about? Well, my brother, mm -hmm. who's a doctor, uh, said that all the birthdays that end with zero, yes, we like a lot because we can demonstrate them with our hands and feet. <laughs> so, if that were true, I would need hands, feet, and your hands. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I turned sixty, and I guess the one great thing about turning sixty, I don't know what the, your favorite thing would be. My favorite thing in the world, when people have asked me what my favorite thing in the world would be, 
vertical is okay, but horizontal is better. Uh -huh. And horizontal without shoes, better. And horizontal without shoes, out socks, best. Uh -huh. And when you're 60, you have the courage to tell everyone around you, I'm going to lie in bed, shoes and socks off. <laughs> My wife made a delicious cake for me. I'm on a kind of restricted diet, uh -huh. as we speak. And uh, she actually made a cake that had no fat in it. Wow. And I enjoyed the day. It was uh -huh. splendid. It was splendid. Gluten-free? Gluten? -free? Yeah. Glut no, I think it. Had, I think it had sugar, that butter, butter fat-free. It it had sugar, but it was butter-free. Ah, yeah, egg-free. But um, I, uh, I had no wisdom from my birthday except that it's a lot of pressure. No, no. I, I, I know people that care a you, lot about birthdays, but I never. Oh, okay. Okay. Very I, few people, by the way, have made a movie about their birthday. That's true. <laughs> That's true. And, and that was also, I guess, sort of a lie. Because actually, we didn't actually film it on my birthday, well, but we no. pretended it was my birthday. Yeah. But that was the, uh, we, I, you know, a few years back, I don't know, you know, I broke my neck. Yes. And then I had to have this heart thing. And when you go through several of those meetings with the Grim Reaper, yeah, you know, you just you're just happy for that day to turn. Every day is a blessing. Every day, yeah, yeah. It's a cliche, but you realize that those cliches are uh, working man's wisdom. Well, they're from the people who've experienced these situations. Yeah. They fall down from that mount, and yeah. uh, when you don't really appreciate it, obviously, until you go through it. You don't need the new bike anymore. No, no. No. You were on horseback at the base of a volcano? Yeah. It was, it was an act. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a wise choice. Well, no. It's called adventurous. It was adventurous. Yeah. Before I'm you sure fall. before the wind takes you and your horse <laughs> into the air. Yes. It's one of the great experiences of your life. Yes, yes. We were thrown. Nobody saw it except that they saw that the horse and I get lifted off the ground and thrown to the other side of the road. And that the horse kind of looked at it as God's way of saying, giddy up. And so uh, he took off and threw me onto a lava flow. The horse did, not God. Yeah, yeah. Or you could say that. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't have video <laughs> we do, we, evidence. We won't go there. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, they took me to Reykjavik. And this was in Iceland? In, yeah, that's, that's that Reykjavik. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they checked me out, and they said that I had fractured my neck. And they put me in one of those goofy soft collars that they wear in The Hangover and other movies to indicate that people have been injured. And, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. I came back to the hotel that, room. That was the extent of it? They just put you in a yeah, neck brace? Yeah, put me in a neck, little soft neck brace. You and broke five? Well, I didn't know that then. Ah, Reykjavik See, said, put on the collar, you're fine. Put on fine. the collar, you're fine. Wow. And I went back, and the first thing I did was I got back to the hotel about 12.30 or 1 in the morning. But it was still, sun was shining because oh, it's yeah. the midnight sun. <laughs> and the first thing I did was play the piano to see if my hands worked. And they did, and then I felt I was okay. And then I went to the our bedroom and Annie went to take a bath because it had been a very long day for her because she was conscious the entire time. Uh, she had to endure the entire worry and wear yeah. of the day, but me, I was in and out. And I thought, well, this is great. I'll lie down. And if anyone has had a broken neck, you know, the, the Icelandic medical, they, they didn't warn me. You have to stay vertical for three months. Vertical. <laughs> so your your life is like you're you're at a bus stop. You're, you're, you're like you're like this all the time without the box and, of yeah, chocolates. <laughs> and and the first thing I did is I thought I would lie down because I didn't know there was a prescriptive against it. And I started to lie down, and the world yeah went away. Sure, the vision went. I couldn't breathe, and I thought, oh my God. I'm dying. And yeah. I forced myself up and I could breathe and the vision came back and I thought, well, we're not doing that again. <laughs> Honey, we're not lying down. We're not lying down, <laughs> sweetie. And Meanwhile, thanks, Reykjavik, for the, uh, for the headband. It was, it was what the hell? It was, it was interesting. Florida's there's never been a war there. <laughs> Nobody wants the fucking place. No, and it's windy. <sighs> oh, but you know, what, you know what they do in Reykjavik? Reykjavik, now this is a fact I didn't know. This was interesting. Uh -huh. uh, Iceland is where... Our space crews go, NASA goes, and practices moon landings because the surface of Iceland, they figured, is most like the moon, this side of the moon. Oh, my God. So they, they go and they practice in the dust, like jumping out of modules. We're most moon-like. Vacation here. Yeah, vacation so here. So yeah. what you're saying is, in 69, that's where they shot. 
Speaking of OJ, that's, Capricorn One. That's I'm where just the saying. Coke can was. You know, they saw the Coke can in the back. It was Icelandic. It was, you Icelandic. read, it was in Icelandic. <laughs> I knew it. But um, it's interesting, you know, when I got back to the United States, in fact, uh, another doctor found out that I broke five of them. In fact, I had the Christopher Reeve injury. He's, oh my he God. used the, that word, and that the fourth vertebra was pulverized. And they put me in a real collar, you know, in a real collar, and little things you realize you can't do, like you can't see your food when you're eating. No. So you know you're like this, and you know that fork's coming up, but you don't know what's going to be on it. <laughs> you know, because and and uh, every day is a every day surprise and, meal. I, three months, was it more than that? or Three and a half months, and that's, that's when I had my audition for Glee. And, and I, I got called in on like a Tuesday to audition for Glee, and I'm like going in like this, and the doctor told me I was going to be well mm -hmm. after three months. Sure. So I go in, and I am go into the waiting room, and first off, it was like empty. So I'm thinking, well, there's something wrong with this picture. But I went in, and I thought, should I go in with a broken neck or not? It's never good for comedy <laughs> to like to go in with a broken with neck. With a bummer. Yeah, bummer, you know, hey. But I took the collar off mm. and stuffed it under the couch like a filthy, rotten, lying bastard. <laughs> and, the, and, I and the man came out, man, yeah. he was a boy. Sure. He was a young, callow lad. Uh -huh. And he said, uh, I'm sorry. We screwed up. It's the wrong day. We're doing Nip Tuck auditions today. Glee is tomorrow. And I said, it's okay. It's okay. Thank God. Thank God. And I pulled my collar off. And I go, you know, I broke my neck. And I was not going to go in. But this is good. I'll come back tomorrow. This is not a problem. And I felt like, that's when I can bring in. The, I got a reprieve. I got a reprieve from the big guy. Uh -huh. And I went home. And then the next day, since I couldn't drive, my dear wife Annie had to drive me. She drove me there, and I thought, we're doing this right. And I went into the audition with the broken neck the next day. Now, this day, the glee, glee is full of people. Everybody's <laughs> singing and you know, getting, getting ready. And I walked in, and there are all the producers you know, sitting there, like they do in those TV auditions. I went in and I said, so this is the deal. Uh, I broke my neck. Three months ago, and they all are looking at me now like I had genital herpes. Sure. And and I said, okay, I'm gonna. I have an audition, obviously, in a long time. I'm gonna take this off now. And if I can do this audition, I'll do it. And if I can't, I just walk out of this room and we'll pretend this never happened. <laughs> and I put it down. Trooper. And I said, I want you to know that if I'm able to do this. We did it together, and I didn't lie on the first date. Nice. And I did the audition, and they called me up a couple weeks later. I got the part. So that was, <laughs> yeah. was of the singing, dancing pedophile. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, now, drug dealer. Yeah, he's become a drug dealer. Is that the latest? Drug dealer under the stadium. I think the network doesn't really like the image I'm per portraying. I don't appear too often. Well, you're a bit of a villain. Well. I think everybody on that show is kind of, you can't really, they're all kind of goofy. Yeah. Can't really chalk it up to the real world. Yeah. It's a heightened reality. We got some, we got, we have some old high school students, you know, we have a extremely mean gym coach. Uh-huh. Just let it go. Yeah, yeah. We let it go in the world of reality. We don't care. But you're having fun. Oh, yeah, I'm having fun with that. I'm, uh. You were just off somewhere doing a movie. I was off this last weekend doing a movie. Uh, Teenage Wasteland. Now, th this is, this, uh, I have a name. Oh, great. Rick is my name. Uh huh. And <laughs> it's another Hollywood story. I know a lot of actors. Mm -hmm. watch, watch your show. And it's, it's another side of Hollywood that I know you know, and a lot of times people d don't realize, is that these people had offered me this part in this movie before, and my agents never told me, Ugh. never gave me the script, never said anything, and it just went by the wayside. But they were professional enough to, to go to my agents first. Right. And then because of my podcast, they knew what my email was. Oh, great. And the producer wrote me and said, did you ever read the script? And I said, no, thank you. I didn't send it to me directly. And I read it, and it's fantastic. Right. And I saw this guy, Mike Odd, as the director. I saw his first film, and it's fantastic. So I thought, 
I'm doing it. Yeah. So, you know, it was, so that's what I did last weekend. It was a great experience. That's up in Vancouver, right? Teenage Race Club? That ain't the one I was working. <laughs> There's another that one. Was my, the, that my was, apologies. yeah. That I was, was thinking of a different film. Is there another one under the same <sighs> moniker? Nope. nope. It's not it's, possible? It's not possible. Um, well, we talked a little bit beforehand about the, uh, the motion picture um, that was not shot during your birthday. Yes. But um, I, what I, what I, I, I mean, remember when this was being talked about as one of those things that, oh, you've got to see this, you've got to see it, this is great, this is great. And the general consensus was that there are, there have been documented um, storytelling uh, films mm -hmm. over the times, uh, and that this was the newest, bestest version. I mean, the response you must have gotten from your colleagues and from, I mean, from the audience at large, obviously, they're, they're pretty great about sharing their love. But I, I imagine people within the annoying industry must have been warmed by it as well. I think, I think it's when it's one of those things you have to twist. I remember Eugene Levy. Uh, <laughs> the whole story is so strange on how it came about. I don't know if anybody knows it, but it's kind of interesting in terms of like, let's do a musical in our backyard. In that uh, Robert Brinkman uh, used to always like me telling my stories in the kitchen, you know, with a couple beers at two in the morning. Uh, they would always be true stories of things that happened to me, uh, either mm -hmm. held hostage at gunpoint in a grocery store and how I got out of it, how I got out of being murdered, uh, being like kidnapped by monks in Thailand and beaten with sticks in a temple, uh, buying drugs for our band in uh, <laughs> Dallas, Texas. Uh, I went to Dallas. Our band was in L.A. I went to Dallas, Texas. They wanted me to buy marijuana for the band, and I'd never done anything like this. Mom wanted to come with me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were stopped by the police during the sale. And uh, I'm in the front seat of a truck with a, cr with a gangster, with a gangster who I was warned, like, don't look him directly in the eye. He's a serious man. And so we, I, he gives me a brick of marijuana. I give him, like, $1,000 in cash, like fives and ones. Uh -huh. That's kind of all we had. And then out the rear view mirror on the side, while we're exchanging, and I put the brick at my feet, I'm looking in the rear view mirror, and I see policemen, like in Heat, that movie Heat, with, you know, I'm seeing them coming up the side with their guns drawn, you know, like guns drawn. And I'm going, <clears throat> I can't say the man's name, or he'll kill me. He'll find me and kill me. But I said to him, I said, outside, outside, don't look in the mirror, look in the mirror. And the guy looked in the mirror, and then he looked at me. This criminal says, kiss me. And I said, what? Kiss me now. And so I, I grab, he says, give me the tongue. So I'm like, I'm like giving him the tongue and the police goes, freeze, freeze. I'm like this and you know, I go like, and they go, what do we have here? Romeo and fucking Juliet, get out of the damn car. Oh, does mama know where you're at? I go, well, actually she does, she wanted to come. And <laughs> so they did good cop, cop, bad cop. He was obviously a bad cop because he was bare chested and uh, had a kind of a human skin vest. Sure. And, uh, and I was kind of the preppy kind of, so they separated us there and he said, what are you doing here tonight? What are you doing here? And I was going like, well, I just, you know, uh, I'm in town visiting and want to be alone. He says, oh no, and you just, you just felt like you had to get some. And I go, well, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> just a little. They were, so con <clears throat> they were so convinced that we were gay they didn't even search the truck? Didn't even look in the truck. Didn't even look in the truck. And he says, don't let us catch you here at this lake again. And they sent us on our way. How genius was this criminal this wanted to say, kiss me. I went, honest to God. Genius. Genius. Hon honest to God saved you a prison record the guy or some was, sort of county lockup. The guy was, I went home and I had this. This is Texas, you said. Texas. Oh, you were going to do time. Do time. Yeah. They would have executed me. They would have executed <laughs> It was Old Smokey. Is that what they call it? Old Smokey at, oh, at the, Huntsville, the prison? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Old Sparky? Old Sparky. Old Sparky. Old Sparky. Yeah. Yes. Thank you on that reference. Very oh. good. Old Sparky. I went home 
and I took this brick of marijuana, and now I'm home with it and don't quite know what to do with it. Mm. So I stick it in my boot. Of course. And then, like, I pack it up in my carry-on bag to take on the airplane. I'm sorry. It sounded like you said you were going to take it on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you really hadn't done this before. Why did they send... <laughs> they sent a fool to do a man's <laughs> job. So I go through... I put my bag through. Mom and Dad are there at the airport. And the bag is going through, and then something, woo, 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 sil sirens. Now, there are different stages of panic, like a, like they have Fujitsu scale of tornadoes. Mm -hmm. Like you know, there's like, you know, there's, you know, where you just stutter, and then there's where you go pale, and then there's. I was like at F4 on sure. the way to F5, where you like turn white with red blotches, actual <laughs> eruptions of the skin. Uh, it's kind of like Black Sunday, that movie with Barbara Steele. Uh -huh. You know, it's actually erupting. And I go, because here I was not only going to be executed in old Sparky. Thank but you. your parents are present. <laughs> parents are present. It couldn't be more humiliating. So the guy said, uh, I'm going to go through this bag. And I go, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He unzips the bag uh -huh. and reaches in and pulls out a pound cake wrapped in foil. Oh, yeah. And mom goes, oh, that's a pound cake I put in there. <laughs> Oh, I wrapped it in foil. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. He goes, no, ma'am. The foil will set it off every time. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry. Here you go, son. You put Take this it. in a movie, and they go, this would never happen. <laughs> never happen. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And I, we, we got back to Los Angeles, and as it turned out, uh, the marijuana that I brought back <laughs> was fine, contaminated. Contaminated with with some sort of ammonia, but we smoked it anyway. <laughs> uh, it it had it had the unique ability to remove the power of speech, so which is bad when you're in a rock and roll band. So you know we we would do the first song, and we you know we rolled it up, and we were smoking out there. and then I started the first song, and I had the guitar, and I was like coming up the microphone, like getting really. I had hair, and I was looking sexy at that time. Uh huh. Uh, and I went up to the mic, I was like. <laughs> and I backed up from the mic, and then I looked over the bass player, who also sang, I said, get up, get up. And he came up, and he couldn't talk, and he backed up. And so no one could speak, and so we did like an instrumental set. <laughs> and, and we went out, we had two more sets to do, and we, oh my at, God. At, the end, at the end of that first set, we were like, I'm like, man, that was good. Let's do that again. <laughs> that was terrible. But, yeah, that was, that was, uh, I would tell those, I got off the track. No, I there would, is no track, my would, friend. Okay. You're doing I, perfectly. I would tell Brinkman, Robert Brinkman, those a stories. A story like that. story he, like that. And he said, let's do a movie. Yeah. And I said, no, that's going to be boring. That's going to be terrible. And so we didn't do anything for like 15 years. And then like in 2000, oh, here's the storybook element of it. So in 2005 was the invention of HD. HD. And we could actually do this film for like almost no money. Right. You know, 40, 40 grand and do an entire feature instead of 500 grand. So I talked to Robert and we both were doing nothing. So we said, let's shoot this movie. And so I kind of put together some of my true stories from my life, movie stories. I didn't include the one about the juice but movie stories mixed with life stories. Mm -hmm. and Did you include the one about the Jews? But not the Jews. <laughs> well, there was one about the Jews. <laughs> yeah. but, but, uh, just one? Just one. The others were cut. Can I hear a little bit about the monks in Thailand who kidnapped you? Okay, I went to buy some grass. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. And you wonder why the good Lord threw you off a horse in Iceland. No, no. <laughs> you had tested the fates, my friend. I, I was doing a movie in Thailand and uh, called Last Flight Out with a cast of, of God. Is I this mean, the one where Bogosian took you to the sex club? Yes! <laughs> Eric Bogosian, the great Hang Noor, James Earl Jones, Arliss Howard, my God. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I mean, I mean... What was the name of this great Richard movie? Richard Crenna. It was called Last Flight Out. It, oh. was, it was about the last flight out of Vietnam. Uh, last chopper out of Nam. Yeah. Well, it was actually not the chopper that we know in the picture. This was an American Airlines jet that was responsible for getting everybody else 
the last flight that left that couldn't get on the chopper. And I played a doctor. In the first half of the script, I had a name Tim. In the second half of the script, I was Jim. So I was Tim Jim, and Richard Crenn always would call me Tim Jim okay. whenever we rehearsed. And then when we, I never really found out what my real name was in that. But while we were doing that movie, uh, I went out with Eric Bogosian, and we went out to various places in Thailand, mm -hmm. Bangkok, one of which being the sex bars. But one time I was walking around, and there was a monk. Um, there are lots of monks all over the street, and they have their little cups. You know, they're holding the cups up like this. And so I took some of my per diem, I think it was like $20, and put it in their cup. And the monk looks in the cup and starts screaming like, and he gets up and he grabs me. I don't want to grab my microphone. He grabs my shirt and he starts shaking me. He starts screaming, in Thai. You know, you can't, I don't want to insult anyone in Too Thai. Too late. Too late. So, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, so I started, the monks started shaking me and screaming, and other monks who have their cups started screaming, and they run and they all grab me. And they all grab me and they take me by the arms, and they're carrying me through, like, this little area, through the streets, and into this stone doorway. And they take me down into this basement and throw me on the stone floor, not hard, but just kind of push me down on the stone floor and there's this gigantic reclining Buddha in front of me with like incense coming up and then they get these canes like canes like, and they start beating me with the canes and I'm going like ah, I'm covering up because you cover up when they start hitting you you don't think of you know sharp or fancy things to do moves that you learn somehow you just cover up and then afterwards one of the monks picked me up and put a medallion around my neck with the reclining Buddha and with the picture of the Buddha there. And I walk back to the hotel, and the concierge, now this is amazing. The concierge was from San Francisco, and his son, his son was Mo Rocca. What? Mo Rocca. <laughs> Mo Rocca. I'm going into the hotel, and Mo Rocca is there, and I said, because I didn't know Mo Rocca from Adam. He was a young fella, young whippersnapper. Sure. Callow lad. And, and he comes up, and, and I said, excuse me, the most amazing, odd thing happened to me. I was just grabbed by these monks and beat with six. He goes, the monks grabbed you? They took you into the temple? Oh, that's a blessing. Oh, they beat you with sticks? That's a serious blessing. Oh, you have the reclining Buddha. You have been blessed. What did you do? And I said, well, I was walking down the street, and I gave, like, I guess $20. $20? You gave $20 to one of those monks? Do you know you gave them in their cup more than all of those monks are going to make in one year? The amount of money you gave to them. You have been blessed. And uh, maybe that's why I wasn't killed in Iceland, as a matter of fact. But um, Meanwhile, you sound like you were beaten and tortured as a way of saying thank you. But I was blessed and... and I gave that <clears throat> a dear friend of mine, uh, Bob, ex-Marine, great friend, one best friend in the world. In fact, our first son is named after Robert. He was going into surgery, serious surgery, from which he did not recover, and uh, uh, brain cancer. Oh, boy. And I gave him the reclining Buddha as a good luck charm. And uh, maybe he had good luck somehow. Somehow, somewhere. Maybe it would help him on his voyage. Maybe it helped him on his way. But um, here's the Bob. Yes. Drink that to Bob. Indeed. Here, I'll give it to Bob. Well, I think the story ends well. Yeah. Was because happy? when you're being taken by the screaming monks yeah. and beaten with the sticks, I'm thinking it's a terrible thing to happen for a guy who's just trying to be generous. <laughs> I'm Truly. Thinking, I'm thinking, yeah, but it was a different culture. You know, in Thailand, uh, the. You've, you've worked all over the place, and, and you know, they sometimes prep you as to local customs. Yeah, they're supposed to. And when we went on the trip to Thailand, we get this whole sheet of paper saying, like, the feet in Thailand are profane. The feet are profane. So do not uh, point a shoe mm. at anyone's face. Really? Uh, don't put your shoes on the pillow of your bed in the hotel. Uh, don't take a coin, which has the picture of the president, flip it in the air, and put your shoe on it. And don't, 
and this is not a joke, this is like for real. You will go to prison if you go outside with your shoes on your head. <laughs> well, shouldn't do, we all? Do, do not. <laughs> How do is that, that not a rule in this country? Yeah, come on. But at least it's punishable there by other kind of flogging. Yeah, so I don't see any of these things happening, but thanks for the warning uh, from the production company. <laughs> shoes on the pillow. I don't recall that ever happening. I always, in a hotel, first thing I do, when see you want them shine. on the pillow. When you want them shined, you can either put them in the bag or if, on the pillow. On the Those pillow. Are the two signs. Right. I guess different don't, culture. Don't flip a coin and step Thanks on it. Thanks for the heads up. You bet. It's the first thing I do. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> I don't see any of those things happening. Um, you're, uh, I listened to the most recent uh, of the Tobolowsky Files mm -hmm. podcast. Yes. David Chen helped kind of set the whole thing up. Yeah, David Chen was, uh, oh, I never got to the fairy tale element of Please. the story. Please. So anyway, well, because it goes into David Chen. Okay. It, it's, you, you segued it perfectly. So, All right. So we shoot this movie about my birthday party where I tell true stories yes. from my life and from whatever. And we have to borrow everything to do this sure. movie in our backyard, in our house, on the beach. There is no script, no rehearsal, no permits, no nothing. And I read you end up using the first take of every story. First take of every story. Unbelievable. So all we... There's nothing, mm. and it is just me telling true stories from my life. But anyway, in the borrowed equipment we had, uh, one of the DVDs that, that Andy, our producer and editor, was working on, went back to the people we had borrowed the equipment from, and they saw this movie, and they went like, this is fantastic. And they called us up and said, would you like to premiere it at the HBO Comedy Festival? And we go, well, yeah, that's better than poking the eye with a sharp stick. And that's where I saw Eugene Levy going in, and he was going to see some other movie. And I was saying, why don't you go see mine? Because you could, this is an old movie. This movie's been around, but this one is going to go nowhere. My movie <laughs> is zero. And he went to see it, and afterwards he came out, and he was crying, and he hugged me, and he said, thank you for forcing me to see this movie. Uh -huh. And I would do that to everyone in America if I could. But, <laughs> yeah. but David Chen saw this movie, and uh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it 100% Rotten Tomatoes, which is good. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes. 100%? 100%. I didn't know that. Yeah. And David Chen saw the movie and wanted to interview me about Birthday Party, right. like how we did it, how on earth, and the, how we shot it. Because when you're only doing these stories and you have nothing to cut to, that the only way we could edit the movie was by doing the same story in different places so we could balance the movie, Andy could balance the movie out. If there were too many sex stories in there, it sounded like Howard Stern. Too many drug stories sound like Cheech and Chong. Too many stories about mom and growing up in Texas sound like the Waltons. So it had to be kind of a balance, which I think Robert Brinkman and Andy did beautifully. And David Chin saw the movie and wanted to interview me about it. He has a film show. Uh, on SlashFilm.com, right. which is kind of is out of Boston, New York, and Los Angeles. And David Chin lives in Boston. And so during the interview, he said, would you be interested in doing a birthday party part two as a podcast? And I'd produce it, and we would just do it at your home in L.A., and I'd record it here in Boston, and he's a master with Pro Tools and everything. And so we said, sure. So that's how the podcast started like a year and a half ago. And then it just kind of... So you two will get on Skype or the phone or whatever, yeah. and he'll set up a topic, and you'll tell a story. No, no? It's, it's like we didn't know how it would work. Right. We, we started off, because it's a film site, I started like, well, I'll do film stories, like just film stories like O.J. Simpson or working on Mississippi Burning or Thelma and Louise. You know, there are, you know, there's millions of stories, Groundhog's Day, millions Well, apparently, of for Jamie, we, we will need a little bit of the stew oh. story from the Yes. Uh, oh, gosh. From Harold, the Ramis. Harold Ramis. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, David Chen said, yeah. please, we'll just do this thing. So, I, I did, like, a couple movie stories, and then, like, my right brain was talking to my left brain and said, you have to tell the story of the day your mom died. Wow. And so I wrote it out, mm -hmm. and I did this story, and suddenly the podcast, like, exploded. Right. And I started getting letters from all over the world. 
right. of people saying, man, so now the podcast kind of takes on its own life. It's either, sto there two rules. The stories have to be true and they have to have happened to me. Like I can't tell a story like Kevin just told me this hilarious story that happened to him or whatever, because then you screw up the story. Right. It's somebody else's story and you don't know if it's true. And the truth of the story, like you said with mom and the pound cake, no one believes that stuff. Right. You can't be clever and think of things like that. Truth always trumps clever. And we started the podcast, now we're into, I just finished writing episode 50 uh, yesterday. Holy crap. Which is, I guess it kind of centers around when I was held hostage at gunpoint in a grocery store, you know, and how I got out of that. That was part of a two attempted murders in one week. Yeah, run. two attempted, well, you were in Connecticut. With Connecticut, two attempted murders, that was different murders. Oh, that's this a was different. in Dallas, Texas. Oh, oh my another God. murder. But, um, <laughs> that, uh, it really is. I mean, come on. No, no, David Chen was right. You're the one that should have this show. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> where, where 50 different shows uh, revolve around stories from your life. Right. It, it, it's, it's, well, our mutual friend Jason Antoon said that, that I am going to have to get a little bit of the. Um, uh, uh, held at gunpoint. Thing. But I thought he said there was another thing about the terrorists. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh, Jason was a part of that. Yes. Oh, <laughs> gosh, I totally forgot that. <laughs> well, apparently. Okay, okay, yeah. here's that story. Have you not done that yet on your? No. Okay. I you, forgot. You, you can audition it here. Yeah, it's. <laughs> He gave me a little bit of it, and I started to. I pat. needed Jason because Jason is of Arabic persuasion. Yeah, and uh, he's Lebanese. Yeah. If I had only known. <laughs> well, he and I are natural enemies, and yeah, we're, I know. we're natural friends. Natural enemies. And, and what can we I work say? together. What a guy! Yeah. What a great guy! Love him. Uh, so, uh, I over the course of a year, you know, we have a fax machine at home, and occasionally you would get ads on fax machines, which are pretty irritating, where you're home and you hear the fax machine at two in the morning and it's like, you know, on where to get your car reupholstered. Yeah. But over the course of a year, I got another thing of a letter that was written in Arabic. And I, I'm going like, well, let's take the one. And then over the, then, over the, then another letter written in Arabic. And then before 9-11, I got another letter written in Arabic, and I have these three letters that are kind of come through the fax machine. And then comes 9-11. And I'm talking to my wife, Annie, I'm saying, do you think any of those letters were important communications that perhaps the FBI or somebody should have seen? And she said, well, maybe you should call the FBI. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> always. I call. By the way, always rule of thumb. Rule of thumb. Don't call them. So I called up the FBI, mm. and I said I needed to talk to an agent because I've received three Arabic faxes, and I didn't know if perhaps it's related to 9/11 in some way. You're still on a no-fly list. <laughs> to, the, to this day, <laughs> to this day, you're still on a no-fly list. Uh, they wanted to know. They wanted to know. Well, who do you? Who do you know? I was well, so no one. This just came to my house by accident. I just wanted to give this to you. I just wanted to send this to you, and and have somebody there who knows Arabic or something read this. And this is why I wanted Jason to read the letter. So I finally get an agent on the phone, and I give them my name and address, and they said just put it in your fax machine and send us the Arab fax. So I put it in. This is the truth. It ain't clever, it's the truth. I press the send button. The fax machine comes to life, and instead of sending to the FBI, I start receiving from the FBI. I start getting page after page after page of terrorist information saying, top secret, for your eyes only, <laughs> do not, you know, and page after page, <laughs> page pictures of these Arabic guys and, part, and <laughs> pictures and like dossiers and all this stuff. Now, not only do they not have the Arabic facts, I have 50 pages of top <laughs> secret information. <laughs> so I call the FBI. <laughs> I call them again and they go, hello? Uh, this is Stephen Tobolowsky. Um, it didn't go well the first uh, time. I have 
50 pages of top secret terrorist information that was just sent. Uh, who are you? I go, uh, Stephen Tobolowsky. I just called someone because I have an Arabic fax. I thought it was related to 9-11. How do you have the Arabic fax? I, uh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was speaking with uh, Agent Oldmeyer before. You know Agent Oldmeyer? I go, well, only casually. <laughs> <laughs> only from the first phone call. Um, I have this. I have a dossier now. Uh, and, it's, and it says, are you guys going to kill me? <laughs> and my wife, Ann, is sitting next to me. and her Run, eyes, honey, run! And her eyes are like big as saucers, and she's like reading it all. And it's about all these people that have been stopped at LAX with $50,000 in their luggage and people with fake IDs and all this. Ooh, should I even be saying this? Oh, of this course is you all should. top secret. So anyway. <laughs> we got it. We got, so we they got, got it. We got it. It's all on tape. <laughs> what are the bridge now? So anyway. He said, whatever you do, don't look at that material. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you do. And whatever you do, don't in 10 years from now divulge any of that material <laughs> on a podcast on the internet. So, so they, they said, you have to shred it. Do you have a shredder? I go, no, sir, I don't. I, I said, I don't have a shredder. I could tear it up for you on the phone. You could hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, give me some other papers. I said, I could bring it to your house. Or whatever, he says, listen, I want you to take that information. I want you to tear it up into little pieces. I want you to put it in the trash can and never call us again. And I go, yes, sir, never do it again. And we, but this was the facts that I wanted Jason to read, right. to read if it was related to 9-11. Well, the good news is you didn't, in fact, tear any of it up. You didn't throw any right. of it away. No, we're we're going to show one piece after <laughs> another. <laughs> We have, let's go ahead and throw up the first one. Bear with us, folks. We've got 50 of these to get through. Let's take a look at the first one. This is the one you showed Jason, right? So let's take a look at the first one. Yeah, we don't have it. Oh, thank God. Oh. Jason. Oh, my God. Oh, my heaven. Did you actually have him read any of it? Yeah, I did. We should ask him what it said. Oh, he, I, he didn't tell you? Uh, he said he was going to... And, and I, I want to make sure, I, I think he said he was going to take it to a friend of his right. to really make sure they get all everything right, because I think it was written in some dialect he wasn't familiar with completely, but he could read it. I think he was implying that it was... Also reupholstery work. Yeah, it, just right. to be, it just happened to be in Arabic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the exact same stuff the you were getting the English faxes for. car stuff, yeah. I don't know. Oh, gosh. Dear Uncle Bob, here's the recipe for that baba ganoush you wanted to make. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I got your fax number right. Right. Oh, gosh. Oh. First of all, don't look at any of it. And stop reading it. Stop it, sweetie. Gosh, oh, my no, goodness. Yeah, yeah. That was Jason. Yeah. Jason. Heaven help us. Yeah, that was, that was terrifying. Yeah, I, for, I totally forgot that story. That one is not on Birthday Party. In fact, I haven't done a podcast about that one yet. Well, I encourage you. Uh, but the, the, the two attempted murders in Connecticut, you're saying, is separate from being held at gunpoint in the Dallas? Yeah, well, when I was, well, I was, they asked me to be on the Tom Snyder show. Loved him dearly. We rip him off at the top of the show every time. And I give him credit. And they, I was, they had a list that said, like, has anything unusual happened to you? That was one of their questions. And uh, I had been called by Buzz Magazine that said I was nominated as one of the 100 coolest people in Los Angeles. One of the coolest. One of the coolest people in Los Angeles. And, and I said, whoa, this is remarkable. And they said, well, you haven't won yet. Uh, you've just been nominated. We don't know who you are. <laughs> so, uh, could you send us a list of things you've done that are cool? And then I had to think of like, well, what have I done that's cool? So like the being beaten by monks in Thailand. Definitely cool. That was on the list. When I was in Hartford, Connecticut doing a play at Hartford Rep, I was almost murdered on a Monday and a Thursday of the same week. Two different parties. Two different parties. Two uh, different reasons. Two different reasons. Both failed attempts. Yeah. As you said in front of us. Oh. One, one of them I read you were just stabbed in the belt. Stabbed in the belt by a man. I was trying to hold the door open to a pizza joint, and he thought I was blocking the door, and he pulled out a knife and stabbed. I was wearing an overcoat, and he stabbed me in the... Well, you gave him no choice, though. You were blocking the I door. Know, blocking the door. You were asking for it. I was asking for it. Please stab me. The other was... So he was trying to gut you and hit your belt. 
he was saying, don't disrespect me and my lady, and he pushed it, but he wasn't like, he didn't like do the, the gut in a frog thing where you <laughs> like my heart thing. <laughs> yeah, went like, yeah. But, but he just like stuck it in there as like, okay, okay, please go and have a pizza. No disrespect, Ben, please. Oh no my God. And I thought, you know, I'm not walking home on this same street again, like twice. Was a three in a match from World War I? Right. Unlucky. You know, so I'm not going to do that again. But the held hostage at gunpoint was in Dallas, Texas. That was... Um, I'm exhausted. I am too. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I have to live with this stuff. That was Hartford, not Bridgeport, for the record. Yeah, for the record. Hartford is a very strange city because they have... Home of the Hartford Whalers? Couldn't be. No. They, they have a lot of uh, bookstores that have, like, you know, in the, in the back of the bookstores, they have, like, these places where you buy, like, S&M stuff. Ah. I have no idea how I know about that, but it's... Bogosian it's, told it's, you. It's Bogosian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I was in the, I was in the grocery store in Dallas, and uh, I was buying, you know, wine and chicken and mangoes. Sure. Which was a new fruit at the time. At the time. Yeah. Just I, to we, give you an idea. We didn't know what a mango really was, except they ate them on Mutiny on the Bounty. And I thought it would be fun. So I was like picking it up and I didn't know if it was ripe, if you had to shake it or if you, how it was ripe. And this older man came up to me and he said, I, I see you have mangoes, most exotic of fruits. And he spoke in a mysterious voice. Well, you don't talk to someone while you've got a grocery cart. It's like as bad as talking to someone on an elevator. You don't do it. I mean, I don't do it. I mean, you don't do it. You don't go up to people and talk, and I thought that was a problem. And then he was like, he started crying, which I thought this is a real problem. And I thought, well, he's senile. He's an old man. I'm just going to give him one of the mangoes. And I bent down the grocery cart to get a mango, and I saw he had a 45 behind his back on his hip. And I came up, and I guess he saw that you saw in my face that I saw. And he goes, I don't know why I picked you today. And he whirled around and put the gun into my forehead. I don't know why I picked you today. Yeah. Oh, God. And the tears are coming down his face. And he's, he says, I contracted this cattle disease in <sighs> South America that leads to suicide or homicide. And my thought was, just my luck today. It looks like homicide. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I the, immediately start chanting suicide, suicide, suicide. 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 Wait, 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 wait. Like, let's wait a little bit. Maybe the suicide will come up. I don't know why I picked you today. Yeah. And, and the, the gun was in my head, and I looked, and I saw that the store was completely empty. At that point. And in my brain, I'm going, you know, oh, fuck. You're dead. And you're dead. And the most curious thing happened. Again, this is true. It's more like, curious, by the way, than the guy taking out the weapon and putting it at your yeah. head. The only thing I could think of was Medical Center on television. Chad Everett. Sure. The Chad, sure, Everett, Chad, Chad Everett, Medical Everett, Center. Because I remember in one of those shows, Chad Everett had a similar scene where someone comes into the emergency room with a gun, and Chad Everett gives the advice to keep the gunman talking. Well, I didn't know. You him. literally thought of that in the moment. I thought of that in the moment. Keep the gunman talking, and I Chad saw. Chad Everett is the reason you're alive. Almost. But I couldn't keep the gunman talking, but I could talk. <laughs> so I didn't know what, what he was doing. So I started talking, and I started cobbling together uh, monologues from Medical Center. Because. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> well, if you remember that, you're not old enough. Sure, you know, sure. The I show. mean, I was a so child. So Chad Everett was the brash young doctor, and James Daly was the head surgeon. His father. So I go like, you know, you remind me so much of my father uh, to the gunman. I go, you remind me so much of my father. My father doesn't love me. He's a doctor. I'm not smart enough to be a doctor. Nothing I ever do is right enough. <laughs> Nothing I ever do is good enough. There's no other girl I could bring home that's right enough for him. Why? All I want to do is love him, and all I want him to do is love me. But he won't. And I mean, I'm going like this like a mile a minute. And, and are you aware that there, this is part of a plan? Just keep him occupied? Oh, I just, it was just like... Hello. Just like, and I started talking about monologues. I just remembered monologues from Medical Center. I used it as material. And while I'm talking to him, I'm looking, and out the front window of the store, I see SWAT guys sure. going back and forth under the window with rifles. I see the back of, a, like, a news truck with the reporter, like, they're, hello, 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 while I'm talking. 
I hear a helicopter above me. And then while I'm talking, because I was talking for like 45 minutes, like nonstop, I see uh, uh, God. paramedic uh, ambulance like come up, park in the parking lot. They open up the back doors of the ambulance and they throw out a body bag and a gurney. And I'm thinking, what's it going to be today, chief? What's it going to be? We're rolling the <laughs> dice. And I felt the adrenaline kind of going down. And I thought like, I'm cooked. I got to do something. I got to do something. And the only thing I could think to do was invite him over for dinner. Sure. And I said, you know, uh, I really have to kind of go now. And uh, we're getting a lot of this worked out. We're, what are you up to now? What are you doing? Uh, you know, I got some chicken here. We're going to eat the mangoes, have a little Italian Swiss colony wine. Maybe you come on over and we keep the thing going. Do uh, you have a pin on you? While he's got the gun, you're my, telling me he had the gun at your forehead head. this entire this entire time. He's doing this. He's leaning against the wall. He's doing this the entire time. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a pin. Much cheaper than that. <laughs> not as not nice. the mighty a pin and tears off some of the brown uh, paper bag from the mango bag and hands me the piece of paper and the pin. And I was so scared. And to write so down nervous. your address yeah. so he could come over? Yeah, we uh -huh. come over. I wrote down my real address. Sure. <laughs> of course. And I handed him the piece of paper. And then came, like, what was kind of the scariest moment for me in that I realized I can't keep talking. I got to go. I got to go. to go. And he's in front of my cart. He's got the gun here. He's holding my cart. And I pushed the cart around him. I said, so you come over. Uh, let me put the chicken in. Right now it's like 6.30, you come over like 7, and you meet my girlfriend, Beth, we'll show you around, and then we'll open up the bottle of wine, we keep it up, we keep talking. What do we say? So I push back, and then I feel the gun go into the back of my head, and then the little voice inside of me was saying, don't turn around, don't turn around, whatever you do, don't turn around. And I kept pushing, and at the corner there was this stack of Pepsis, and I thought like the little voice was saying, you get around those Pepsis, you could run. If you get around the Pepsis, you could run. And I'm pushing, and I don't look back, and I don't look back, and I turn and pass the Pepsis. And as soon as I pass the Pepsis, the SWAT team had been in there the entire time. While I was doing my medical center monologue, <laughs> they had snuck in the back door and come down the aisles of food on either side and had guns their rifles pointed through the food at us the entire time. And as soon as I rounded the Pepsis, I hear this commotion. I look back. They had jumped over the food. You know how high those aisles are at the store? They jumped over, and that guy was completely tied in like eight seconds. They had his ankles, and they carried him out like a snake, like a boa constrictor. They just carried him out of the, the store, and he's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. they carried him out, and I took my little cart up, and I'm in the deserted store, and I stand over at the cash register, and I wait. And a policeman comes up to me and says, hey, buddy, you can just go. <laughs> <laughs> so I go home. My girlfriend, Beth, is there. And she says, well, where were you? <laughs> and I, I said, well, I was What the just, hell took you so long? I was just held hostage at gunpoint. And she says, well, it took a long time. I said, it does. <laughs> <laughs> that is a long process. So we cooked up the chicken. Oh, man. my word. Now, uh, while you're doing the monologues, um, are you aware of his uh, appreciation of your efforts? Or is he just, uh, just, if in fact you were going at it 45 minutes or so it seemed, yeah. Um, I didn't hear if he was interjecting at all, if he was saying anything, if he had his own point of view. Yeah, no one has ever asked me that question before. Uh, he didn't talk, but I could tell from his eyes he was engaged. Right. I could tell from his eyes because he was kind of like listening and nodding to me. It's probably why you were, your brain was working a little faster and, 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 and as a survival code. Almost. Yeah. He's engaged. As long as I keep talking, I'm going to be fine. Right. Because that's what I was sort of picking up as you were telling the story. Because I just felt if there, I had the feeling that if there was a vacuum, right. if there was a void of any kind, out of the void, he would think of something else to do. Well, he would and yes. possibly be able to finish. What yeah, finish what he wanted to do. Uh, oh, gosh. 
I remember, I remember standing there because they're separate realities that happen. Sure. I'm seeing the police and all that stuff happening out there. I'm talking to him. And at the same time, I'm thinking, why aren't they I, coming in here and saying, no, me? I was, I was 25 years old. I was 25. I'm 60 now. That was what? How long? 35, 35 years. Yeah. 35 years ago that happened. And I'm standing in there thinking in the grocery store. I remember while I'm talking, while I'm looking out the window thinking, this could be my last day on earth. I could be one of those people that you read about in the paper that die when they're 25. That, I, that notion pops into your head while you're doing a moment. While I'm doing it. And while I'm seeing the police, like a whole other me sure. sticks up and says, like, hello. Right. You know, I, I completely believe the stories about the women who lift the automobiles to save their babies. I completely believe, you know. Um, that survival mode and that. It's, it's, it's somewhat related when, when I had the surgery. And they give, you, they give you medicine to kind of paralyze you. And they have to wait till your body has certain signals before they take the breathing tube out. Well, unfortunately, my brain woke up before the rest of my body did. And I was awake and alert and knew that all those tubes were going down my throat. And I couldn't, I was strangling. I couldn't breathe. And the nurse was whispering in my ear, and she said, don't chew on the tube, don't chew on the tube. And I'm like, and I feel yeah. like I'm choking to death. Sure. And I found, and I looked up at the clock, and the first thing I did was I saw, the first conscious memory I have was, it said 2 o'clock, two zero zero, And I'm there choking and can't breathe. And then some little part of me said, there's a little place in you where you can live. And it's like right down in this little corner. If you just get yourself in that little corner, wow. you could breathe and stay alive. And I tried it, and I could breathe and not choke on the tube. And I looked up, and it was 2 o'clock. 2 zero, zero, and then it went 1. 2 oh, one. The time had slowed down for me so monumentally right. that the inside of me was as fast as that guy when I was talking to the guy, but the outside of me was moving like ice in a glacier. Mm -hmm. And they didn't take that tube out until 6 o'clock. And that four hours was the most extraordinary period of time I've ever had in my life, where every minute was um, believable. Right. And unless I kept in that little place, I would choke. I would strangle. And I... The concentration. Yeah. I guess when you go through these things, uh, you try to learn lessons. It, well, you, you do learn lessons. You do. Yeah. There's no trying. Yeah. The, By the, surviving. The lesson I learned that moment was past is like pretty unimportant except for podcasts and a drink afterwards. Yeah. You know, the bar. Future. Everything. Promise to nobody. Nobody. Uh -huh. Not even us in this room. We could be hit by a piece of the Andromeda constellation. You're not wrong, sir. Yeah. The only thing you have. The here and now. Next moment. The next moment. Right. You only have that next little beat where you could either say, I love you, or you could say, I regret what I just did. And and you can make that choice to do that then. And that's it. That's all your life is, is that next moment. And that's And the where's only... Eric Bogosian? Where's Eric? Where is Eric? <laughs> God, brilliant. Brilliant guy. What a writer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he <laughs> He was a bit of a scamp. <laughs> bit of a scamp. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, holy crap. Uh, I don't want to uh, not include yeah. our audience yes. as they offer up questions yes, sir. via Twitter. Are you enjoying your time on Twitter, by the way? I am. Yeah. I, I find it very interesting. Yeah. I'm a narcissist, so it's nirvana. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I realized and started talking about it in my act that I don't know what I'm doing at all, clearly. Because I will start the day with 200,000 followers, and I'll tweet, I think I'm going to make a sandwich. And then 20 people will reply to it, what kind of sandwich? 
And then I'll tweet what kind of sandwich I'm going to have, and then two people will reply, mmm. <laughs> so I've taken 200,000 in the palm of my hand, reduced it to two. Uh, but at least they like it. <laughs> but they're very into that sandwich. I don't think I know what the fuck I'm doing. All right, from Facebook, sir, yep. Eddie Nunn mm -hmm. would like to know, Stephen, Given your countless appearances in TV and movies, has there been a role that made you think a mark has been made in your career? Now, as a character actor, I can uh, suggest that, having been asked a billion times, when you're doing it, man, did you know how special it was? I mean, all you know are what the elements are in the moment. How did you feel when you were doing Avalon? Yeah, I felt like I'm surrounded by brilliant actors and I'm the luckiest Jew in the block, is what I felt. Brilliant script, brilliant performance by you. Brilliant performance by everybody. You're right. Yeah. It was a stunning thing. Did you know at the time it was going to be like a great, great, great movie? I didn't know it was going to be Barry's masterpiece, which one could argue. Mm -hmm. uh, I just knew that I was surrounded by absolutely brilliant stage actors and I was a comedian. This was my first dramatic role in a film or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I was guy at the bookstore in 30-something. <laughs> One of those roles where you just have a, a title, not a name. <laughs> bookstore Sorry. guy. I'm just a fan. I'm just a fan. We so, knew it. <laughs> so I just knew that I was surrounded by greatness, and, and um, uh, that was it. And there's been those moments where we're fortunate enough to be in something that turns out to be mm -hmm. incredible and remembered mm -hmm. and, and Groundhog Day in more ways than one pun intended. Yeah. But was there a time when you were in the pocket and you felt other than your own experience was going to be special that somehow this question has always been trite to me so I guess I'm trying to pat it when no, I, lofting I, it to I you. I hear you. I, I think you know there's a whole difference between whether the public buys it right. and whether it's going to be a great experience. When I did Groundhog Day I remember when I got on that movie, I th thought the script was kind of okay. Yeah. It was so-so. It was kind of a, a typical kind of Bill Murray movie. Bill with, like, no consequences and fun the same kind of scene, you know, uh, sleeping with different women, robbing cars, uh, tearing places up, robbing banks, all sorts of stuff. And then at the end he got bored, tried to kill himself and couldn't do it. And then he decides not to be a jerk anymore. That was kind of pretty much the movie. We got on the set, and Harold Ramis and Danny Rubin, the writer, just stopped, and they said, wait a minute. What would really happen if we had no consequences? Let's rethink this. They threw half the script away. Mm. And Jesus. then they started rewriting, and we were getting green double buff, yeah. double cherry. We were getting pages hot off the press and we were reading this thing and I was going like, this is magnificent. Wow. Now I don't know if that's an answer to his question, but they, they started, at, they moved Bill's suicide to more the middle of the movie mm -hmm. and added all of his piano playing and the kid falling from the tree and saving the old man and not saving the old man and the mayor and the old ladies. All that stuff was kind of added at the end of the movie and it's what made it like from a good movie and a great, fun Bill Murray vehicle. To a classic. To a classic and the greatest Bill Murray performance. Uh, I mean, the one that I love the yeah. most. It's just a beautiful performance. That was special. And when I read the script Memento, mm. uh, Jesus. I had no lines in it. Uh, I ended up with lines in it, but I read it. And I said to Annie, I said, this could be the best script I've ever read. Yeah. And so I knew at the time, all you could do is relate to the material. Yeah. If, if you relate to hits, you know, when we did Great Balls of Fire, we thought we were in a multi-billion dollar film. Right. We thought Jerry Lee Lewis and Winona and Dennis and they what gave Dennis great performances did, yeah. and everything was terrific. No, didn't, it didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen off you the screen. You can't be result-oriented, I think. I think it's a complete waste of time, not just in our business, in life. Yeah. But, but those two films, I think Groundhog Day and uh, Memento, I knew going into it that I wanted to be a part of it uh, just because the scripts were so good. Right. Well, Groundhog Day ex post facto. Right. But so while you were in it, there was a... While I was in it, there was an excitement that we all knew, yeah. like, like when you were doing Avalon, we, you all knew that you were a part of something 
that really had the potential to come together. Yeah. There are certain projects that you sense um, whether or not it's going to be a hit, whether or not it's going to be a blockbuster. It's going to have legs. Mm -hmm. This will speak to the next generation and the one after that. When we, we did Thelma and Louise, we had no idea. Uh, Ridley Scott directed that. I remember uh, we had finished shooting it and I was walking down Wilshire Boulevard and Ridley had come out of a building because Stephen, Stephen, I just saw the film. It's great. <laughs> he was shocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big surprise, you know, and it was great. Yeah, sure. And was. You, you know, a lot of times movies are more alchemy than chemistry. Right. And you, the ingredients kind of come together and they just become bigger than the whole. You know, they're, they have a bigger kind of. Yeah. In that case, you, you also have to deal with that young whippersnapper that was on the. That, the and Briar Pitt fell, he kept calling me, sir, sir, could I get you some tea? Sir, uh, would you like to sit in my chair, sir? I never felt so old and ugly in my life. <laughs> he's still a sweetheart. He's still sweet a sweet guy. He's still a good old boy. Sweet guy, Nicest man. Guy. He tore it up in that movie. Nicest tore guy in the world. Up. And can't stand marijuana either. Hates the stuff. That won't, come, won't go anywhere near won't it. Go any, won't touch it. No, don't bring me the marijuana. Nope. <laughs> um, you've uh, worked with a couple of my heroes, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I can't believe we uh, didn't end up working together on, yeah. on something. But um, uh, Mel Brooks and Woody Allen, coming from my background, are, are as Mount Rushmore as it gets mm -hmm. in, the, in the comedy true uh, voice originals. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to show your, the, one of the scenes from Spaceballs at the opening, but decided to go with the, your great story instead. But uh, how much fun was there to be had on that set? Yeah, uh, that was, uh, Spaceballs was one of the first movies I ever did. Right. And uh, I was in this play that was a bit of a disaster. Mm. How can I say that three times fast? Uh, Bill Pullman was in it, and uh, my wife Ann played a baboon. Sure. And I played a man in pajamas. Of course. And it was kind of a kind of existential Roman Jesus at the time of his crucifixion, a play called Barabbas by Michel de Gelderode. He never wrote it for humans. He wrote it for puppets. He wrote it for <laughs> marionettes, and he was proud of it. Uh, the director was from the National Theater of Norway, and he brought his wife over to play Jesus. Uh, of course. So American audiences were a little... Confused? Confused that uh -huh. Jesus was such a babe. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and so I was out on stage and uh, performing with a parachute over my head, doing a monologue that I'm having a bad dream, and uh, my fellow actor never showed up on stage. And so uh, I, it was King Herod, and he, he never showed up to do the next scene. So I took the parachute off, and... I said to the audience, the paying audience, um, let me explain what's supposed to happen at this part of the show. Did you? You broke the wall? I said, at this part of the show, I, as Pontius Pilate, how many of you know King Herod? <laughs> Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Anyway, from the back of the theater, I hear, stop, stop, stop. This is impossible. Our director from Norway. <laughs> He came down onto the set. That's him now, by the way. Yes, there he comes. <laughs> and the audience is, like, thrilled. And they're sure. going, like, he says, so King Herod is not here? I go, no, King Herod. He says, maybe you do the nightmare one more time with the parachute? <laughs> I said, well, then it would become a recurring nightmare. It would be a rewrite. He said, try it. We see if Herod shows up. So I did it again. No Herod. Maybe he comes out and plays the Herod? Maybe. <laughs> No Herod, and Stein yells from the back of the theater. There are like 300 people there, and goes, do the nightmare again. The audience is going, no. no not, not again with the fucking nightmare. Herod comes running out, and the audience starts applauding. Hooray! <laughs> he has a terrified look. He starts performing, and as I'm performing, I notice a kind of ganja smell. I think we're developing a theme here. <laughs> a theme, a theme <laughs> very potent Thai stick kind of smell about him. And, we're and back we go, in Thailand, too. And we're doing, we do our scene. And then someone else enters, he goes, I'm sorry, I missed my entrance. Uh, I found a great place under the, under the stage to smoke. And I said, well, as long as it's for a good cause, <laughs> man, you leave me frying out here. Wow. So it turned out Mel Brooks saw the show. Shut up. Yeah. 
and called me, got my number somehow from the theater and called me at home and said, Stephen, saw that show, uh, walking around with the parachute on your head. Very strange. <laughs> Very strange. Uh, I said, well, our director is from uh, Norway. He says, I know, but performing with all that fabric. <laughs> <laughs> Very strange. Says, you know, we have, we have, uh, we're doing this movie with Bill Pullman, and uh, Frank Langella was going to play this part, Captain of the Guard, but he's dropping out, so maybe you could do it. What do you think? You come by the studio, we'll work it out, we'll see what we come up with. So I showed up uh, Monday, and uh, they didn't get to my scene. I just got to hang out with John Candy and Rick Moranis and all that, you know, just sat and be a fly in the wall and watch it. Uh, Bill, uh, and uh, didn't work Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday. Finally, they shot my free scene Friday. I was getting a little pissy. Uh -huh. You know, I didn't know. I didn't know. I just saw in movies that actors get pissy when they have to wait. And I was going like, you know, finally get to me. And the AD, the assistant director, said, you know, they pay you for every day you're here. I said, you're kidding. <laughs> you mean they're paying me since Monday? And they go, yeah, right on. <laughs> in movies, they pay you not to work. This is fantastic. So I realized I wanted to get away from the stage. Yeah, 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 quickly. And go into movies. And uh, that's when I did uh, Spaceballs. That was uh, a great experience. I, I later worked with Mel on uh, Mad About You. And he brought up some of the Spaceball memories of uh -huh. that, too. Uh, God, he's so brilliant. Yeah. I mean, and when you, again, it's like when you watch a really great magician and, and you go like, how do they do that? Yeah. And when you, in Mad About You, you know, he threw the script out and just starts making stuff up and it's funnier than anything ever in the script. No offense to the writers, but it was just hysterical. Right. And you go, how is he pulling that stuff out? I mean, Maybe he had a team of writers doing it for weeks beforehand. Yeah, no, he was an original thinker who was... Amazing. Yeah, funny came to him like breathing for Amazing, yeah. amazing, yeah. But it was, it was, again, you watch it like you watch Mount Everest and you go like, wow, beautiful. You sit in awe. You sit in awe. Jamie, I want to offer you an opportunity for a little follow-up. I didn't, I didn't, sorry, I moved off of the Ramis. Uh, you have to understand that there is an era of, of Harold Ramis's, yeah. uh, I think it's the 70s? I'll take them all the way up to like 92. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, during the Stripes era, mm -hmm. when uh, uh, for, for my, uh, my better half here, he's the sexiest Jew alive. <laughs> uh, there's no explaining it, there's no rhyme or reason. Thankfully, I love Egon, that too. Ramis. That's the thing. When I, was a, when I was a little girl, I loved, like, all the girls loved Peter Bankman, not me. I, I, I loved <laughs> Egon. He's my man. Yeah. Thankfully yeah. for me, he's uh, currently, you know, blown up like a poisoned dog. But back in the day, <laughs> what happened? Who's the Kenny? Why would you? Now we can't ever get him on the show. <laughs> he's at home right now going. <laughs> um, did you have a follow-up question for the Ramis, perhaps, uh, from, uh, I didn't want to. No, I was. I know. I just liked that they completely rewrote the script. That was great. Yeah, that he, is he, pretty spectacular. That. He did. He said two two things. Oh yeah, the Stu thing. Well, well, I asked him when I was doing Ned Ryerson if I was after the first. You know, I was doing another movie at the time called uh, Calendar Girl mm -hmm. in Paris, California. Not P E R I S. Yeah, P E R R I S. Could have been Paris, Texas. Yeah, also. It could have been skydiving Paris. there. But they had the same, uh, the same um, production unit coordinator as Groundhog Day. Uh -huh. So that means they could violate union rules. Sure. So I was shooting the one movie, and they fly me up to Chicago with no sleep because it was technically a different film, and I didn't need 12-hour turnaround. Oh, my God. So they fly me up there. I get to my hotel at, like, 2.30 in the morning. I have a note there that I'm first up. I'm to meet Harold. Ramis and Bill Murray on the street at 6 o'clock to do the street scene, and I'm in a panic. And I look in the mirror, I think like, okay, you have like two, three hours of sleep. you got to do this. you got to do this. It's important. You cannot crap out on me now, Stephen. you got to do this. And I went down on the street, and Bill is a big guy. He's bigger than me. He's like 6'5", something like that. He says, so what are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, I thought he was going, whoa, 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 whoa. And he said, okay, well, you could do that. He says, that works. You could do that. And I went up to Harold Ramis. I said, please, tell me, uh, is what I'm doing too broad? Too broad for this? He goes, no, 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 Stephen. You are the spice in the stew. You are not the stew. 
Bill is the stew. When you're doing a movie, one person is the stew and the other is the spice in the stew. You could be as big as you want to be in a movie. Um, no. He told me that um, an important thing that stayed with me my entire life, and it's for everybody out there who is an actor, watches the show, and is discouraged, as we often get, wants to be a director, wants to be a writer, is discouraged. Harold Ramis told me once, he said, Stephen, it is impossible to succeed in this business without four angels. You need four people that for no reason come from somewhere you never expected mm -hmm. and give you a hand and help you. Uh, in my life, I've had at least four. Uh, you know, uh, Alan Parker in Mississippi Burning was an angel to me. Uh, I was signed on to be on that movie for two weeks playing the head of the Ku Klux Klan, but because of thunderstorms, they kept me on for 10 weeks. And I had a knock on my trailer one day, and Alan Parker was there, and he said, I heard you're interested in directing. Uh, since you're going to be here a while, maybe you'd like to follow me around and see me do what I do. Oh, my and God. And I'm thinking like, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, people do this all the time. I go, yes, sir, sure, I'll do it. And uh, so I started following Alan around. I, he invited me into camera planning. He, he, on, on how we're going to shoot another scene. Right. He took me into film editing, sound editing, the uh, costume department, the set, every aspect of film, every aspect. He said, this is what we do here this week. And then we start saying, OK, how are we going to shoot this scene tomorrow? And I'd be in there, and the DP was there. The, all the camera guys were there. And I said, well, um, let's see. We start with a wide shot. And then we're going to move into a closer to, and then we're going to end up in close up because it's really intense at the end of the scene. He says, that would work, but it's boring. It's not good. This is the way we do it. And then he would tell me this, and he started quizzing me wow. over and over again. Uh, I was pretty inexperienced when I did Mississippi Burning. I didn't realize that people don't do that. Mm. And this master filmmaker gave me this benefit yeah. of his lifetime uh, in a completely unrestricted manner. And I remember I ran into him at Westwood at one point, uh, and I said, Alan, I never thanked you properly for what you did for me. Uh, I never became a film director like he thought I was going to, like I thought I was going to, but I learned so much from you that I never would have learned from anyone. And he says, oh, stop it, stop it. Go away, go away, go away. Nice. You know, so that was nice. But uh, Definitely one of your angels. One of my angels. And when I was in Paris, California, no, Paris, France, <laughs> my, my son was there, and it was his birthday wow. in Paris, France. And it, for his birthday present, he wanted me to do his laundry. They have very few laundromats in Paris. It's mm. very day class A. So I endeavored to do his laundry in Paris, France, and I'm walking with a giant armload of dirty clothes, and this Englishman comes up to me and says, excuse me, you're Stephen Tobolowsky. And I, I go, yes. He says, I'm a dear friend of Alan Parker. Uh, you worked with him in Mississippi Burning. He speaks fondly of you often, and I wanted to tell you Alan sends his regards. And I go, thank you. Once again, say thank you to Sir, Sir. Alan at this point. Yeah. But he was definitely a hero. But Harold Ramis said this, and now after he said that to me, I didn't feel so badly about how difficult this business is yeah. and the disappointments people feel. And I'm never surprised when an angel kind of sticks a hand out and says, here's, here's something for you. Yeah. Um, that is actually a, a pretty great thing for, for anyone listening or watching to take with them in, in in life far beyond our little microcosm of show business. Uh, speaking of angels, yes, and this might be the transition of the show. Uh-oh. Sammy? Yes? A little thing we like to call, who tweeted? Roll the intro! Yeah, well, thank no audio in here still. No audio in here. No so one cares. Who tweeted? It they don't want us to hear it. Oh, it's 
That's exciting. This is a little game that uh, okay. we played, another one of the games that Jamie created for the show. Um, by the way, remember what earlier before when I said I can't tell you how long we're going to be in there talking? It's going to yes. be a matter of time if I tell you. And then during the show, I'll say, can you believe we've been talking for... Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't be frightened. <laughs> <laughs> it's the time. It's the opposite of me with the tube down my throat. It's like, oh, I just got that time back. <laughs> and I spent it with you. Can that be on the poster? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the opposite of that time I spent with the tube down my throat. <laughs> that's, that's how much fun I had with Kevin Pollack. <laughs> that's the four-star rating. <laughs> that's it. And then that quote. That's it. Uh, Sammy, please explain how the game works. Oh, it's a wonderful game. So no, this right? is how Who Tweeted works. As okay. we talked about before, all of these tweets were either written by Tyra Banks, Paris Hilton, or Justin Bieber. Okay. And so I'm going to, it's a series of eight tweets, I'm going to read a tweet, and then you and Kevin are playing against each other, you buzz in, you buzz in by saying your own name, and then uh, whichever one he rings in first, I'll point to you, and okay. then you have three seconds to tell me whether you think it's Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. Okay. You buzz in, you get it right, you get yourself five points. Cool. Buzz in, get it wrong, you're going to lose three. No! Consequences. Yeah. There's consequences. consequences. That's right. That's no. right. We punish ignorance at this game. Oh, no. I could end up in negative territory. You could. I well, have. We've, I have. We have. wash your car or anything? It's no, negative. no, but okay. here's what happens if you don't win. Yeah. You are not going to win this 20 U.S. dancing dollars. The dancing Andrew Jackson? The one I gave to the monk. <laughs> there it is. It could come it's back to me. Come back to me. There he goes. There he goes. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Do you know the rules? Yes, sir. Here we are. Who tweeted? Tweet number one. Good luck. Wow. What an incredible premiere night. I feel so proud. All my East Coast friends came to my party to support me tonight. I am so happy. Justin Bieber. I'm sorry. No. Oh. That's okay. We're beginning in negative territory. <laughs> okay. I was going to say Tyra. It would have been Paris. No, we really? both would have been wrong. Yeah. She had an opening night. I know. That's, that's what I'm like I said, I'm, I told you, these are a little tough. Okay. A little tough. Here yeah. we go. I'm chastened. Tweet number two. Uh huh. Dream so damn big that people laugh in your face. Then prove them all wrong. My hero, Richard Branson, does just that. I hope to follow. You? Kevin Tyra. That is correct. Uh-oh. You know, I, I'd like to... Uh, Start over? No. <laughs> I just want to bring up... Yes. ...that you did not read that with a kind of normal inflection. <laughs> no, he's, he's not doing line he's readings. Kind, he's kind of... <laughs> you kind of doing that. Are you going to do that to throw us off? Yes. Because like I, I was going to go Tyra, but you, you had such a right, sister well, thing going. He's gonna, well, the problem is, if I wanted to read that like I felt it was with the intent that it was written, it would be, Dream so damn big that people laugh at... If I wanted to do now that... he's singing crows. What's <laughs> happening over here? Yeah. See, that's a giveaway. Okay. And he's, if I wanted to read the... He's going to have a consistency, though. If I wanted... That's the good news. They're okay. all going to be big. Okay. And right. Okay. They're all big yeah. and over okay. the top. Okay. And the Paris There'll be ones, no interpretation. I'm already, like, so in the hole. The, oh, no, no. no. You're fine. Okay, you're here fine. This okay, is, here we go. You're, here don't, we go. Nothing to worry about. Okay. Tweet number three. Yeah. Today was my high school reunion. Amazing day with old friends. Tobo Bieber? Oh, sorry, no. Too young to have a high school reunion. Way too young. What's the matter with you? <laughs> he well, gets I people because he was we had the got... school for performing arts. Oh yeah. <laughs> and they kind of put you it's on possible the it could have been his middle school reunion. I think I'm stuck at this. Game. No, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> By the way, this is no test of life. Yeah. No, this it's, is not it's okay. I just see negative six to five. <laughs> don't don't sweat it. That was Tyra. 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 I know. Tyra. I know. Did, were you gonna say Tyra? No. No. You just were smart enough. They're, you play poker. You're smart enough to know when to hold them. <laughs> when to hold them. These are hard. They're not easy. They're not. I, they shouldn't be easy. Jamie goes through and this is why I always picks lose very at typical. poker. It's all right. I get big on the two kings. You should come to our game. Yeah. I'll lose. He just saying. Yeah. Uh huh. Well. Tweet number four. Yeah. Everyone out there having BBQs and having a good time. Enjoy the weekend. Hashtag good times. I read that with the. Punctuation that was in there, which is zero. Everyone out there having BBQs and having a good time, enjoy the weekend. Hashtag good times. Tubbo Bieber. That is correct. Yes, there we go. We're still nice in negative time. We call that getting off the schneid. Yeah, we are. Yeah, almost. You are off the schneid, sir. There we go. Tweet number five. Mm. Feel it. 
on my way to the NBC Experience Store at Rockefeller Plaza. Be there at 12.30 p.m. to meet my fans. See you all soon. Kevin Paris. That is correct. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh -oh. Man, I think that kind of seals my fate. No, 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 no. Don't you worry. <laughs> no, no, got, no, there's no, a lot of twists and turns. There's twists and turns in this game. Yeah. <laughs> Tweet number six. Tweet number six. Don't let others define you. Check out my latest blog and tell me how you were busting out of that box. Tubbo Tyra. That is correct. Oh, he's on track. Oh boy. I watch him back in the plus top column. Model religiously. Oh. Back in the plus column. Okay. Nicely done. Tweet number seven. Thank you all again for all the amazing compliments. You have no idea how much they mean to me. Love you all so much. Kevin Beaver. Oh, sorry, no! No! <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so happy? Because <laughs> now we have a real game. Okay, so I'm plus seven. You are, and you're plus four. That's right. And what question number is this? This is about to be tweet number eight. The eighth and, and final, final tweet. If you get this correct, you win. If you buzz in and get it wrong, you are tied. This we is, go into a, a tiebreaker. This is like WrestleMania. <laughs> this is exciting. Open heart surgery was nothing. Nothing. <laughs> tweet number eight. Yeah. All the marbles. All the marbles. I love my fans with all my heart. That isn't going to ever change. There will be times when I want privacy. Kevin Paris. Tobo Bieber. Unfortunately, because Kevin rang in first, we are tied. I was it wrong. It was Bieber. So I was wrong. You were wrong. Minus three, which puts me at plus four. It is a tie game. We are tied. We're going tied into a tiebreaker. This good, is it. Good luck. This is good it. Good luck Everyone to you. Everyone wants to know who the author of the tweet prior to that was. I guess you didn't mention Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, tweet number seven, uh, thank you for all the amazing compliments. You have no idea? That was Paris. Okay. That was Paris. So sorry. Okay. Sorry, guys. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do this. All right, guys. Mow. This is it. Mow. <laughs> That's right, Christopher Walken next. <laughs> you ready, Kev? Yeah, go Here ahead. Here we go. Hey, New York! Tune into Channel 4 at WNBC at 8.30 a.m. I'll be on live! Another NBC thing. <sighs> Kevin Tyra. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner, Mr. Steven Tobolowski! But I'm a Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton, Paris Hilton was the uh, final answer. We have our winner. Great pleasure. Wait a minute. You earned that the hard way. This uh, does come back around from Thailand. Certainly. How about it? It is the full circle of money life. Of money life <laughs> and the Buddha coming back to Moi. There you go. And thank goodness it could happen only here. Only here right in America. Here. Live on the internet. On the chat show. <laughs> Capo, valiant effort, sir. Thank you. Valiant thank you. Sam Levine, let's hear it, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Sam. Thank you, Sammy. <laughs> All right, sir. I will ask for a little bit of, uh, 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 of the Christopher Walken. But first, we allow the audience to come back into our world. Okay. They're asking these questions live from the interwebs. This one from Facebook, Aaron Fuller, has a tweet five for you. Q David Keckner. T5. T5, Again, no sound. T5 forever now. It's okay. He's saying Tweet 5 forever now. It's another game we like to play. The Tweet 5 is five questions. Yeah. Rapid fire, uh -huh. Coke or Pepsi, no correct answer, just this or that. Okay. Just... But they're designed for you. Okay. By the fans. Eric Bogosian or Spalding Gray? Eric Bogosian. Sam Shepard or David Mamet? David Mamet. Buddy Holly, Roy Oberson? Roy. David Byrne, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh! Right? A little bit of a Sophie's Choice. Yes. <laughs> I got you. I have to go with David. Uh, an Alan Smithy film, Burn Hollywood Burn, <laughs> or oral surgery without anesthesia? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. See, they know you they and they write me. these they wonderful. They know Alan Smithy film. Yes. Oh, boy. 
Um, so, uh, would you mind giving us a little Christopher Walken? Because we're such big fans here, and you've had the honor of working with the man. I own, I worked with him on uh, Country Bears. Right, honey. Did you hear Country the Bears? Wall of fur. Country Bears. They were kind of mechanical bears, but they also had people in them. Uh, but if the bear went screwy, you know, it was like really <laughs> screwy. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, Chris Christopher was only there for I think one or two days, and uh, I was going up to him to tell him how much I enjoyed him and all of his work, you know. And he was going up and he had this Dixie cup, you know, full of something interesting. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I was going, uh, excuse me, Mr. Walk, and he was going in to do a thing. Excuse me, I didn't want to bother you now. I just wanted to tell you how much I loved you. Oh, where did you get this? He goes, you have to do the voice. So he goes, oh, it's vodka. <laughs> And he walked right in. <laughs> so that was my interchange with Christopher Walken. He never acknowledged that I appreciated his performance. And oh, it's vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. And then went on his way. Went on his way. That was my only Where did you get the, uh, you asked him, and he yeah. said, oh, it's vodka. It's vodka. So he brought it himself. Oh. They, <laughs> yeah. don't, they don't have that at craft service. No. No. It's hard to find a craft service. Yeah. You know the bears? The movie Country Bears. Country. Well, this was a movie, of course, after you know, based off of the attraction at uh, Disneyland, which yes. is no longer there, but it's still Disney World. Yes. But I love, I love the Country Bears. Yeah. The, the attraction, a, not the this movie. The movie was great. They didn't great. really use the characters from the, the the attraction, which I did not appreciate. The hardcore fans. I think there yeah. was a Big Al, but that was about it. Was yeah. there a Big Al? But they did not use Gomer, Wendell, or Henry. Sons of bitches. You know. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> It was, Nobody knows what I'm talking about no, no. but me. <laughs> it was a phenomenal and amazing experience. If you've been in like movies that don't do well, I guess it refers to the first question. You'd be in movies that like tank at the sure, box sure. office. But there's still amazing things like uh, the little bear in that was a, a, a woman who, who was the little bear in that. And she was about four foot like eight or something like that. She's little. So this is what she had to do to rehearse. Mm. First thing she did is she comes in with the bear suit on, not the head, because once the head goes on, you have two minutes of oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> so she does, she does. That's not pressure at all. She has to eat her dinner. Then she gets up and jumps onto a skateboard and skateboards out the front door, does a drop of like eight steps, and lands on the board at the bottom. So she does, she, eat, she has to feel where her dinner is because she can't look because the bear doesn't have eyes. She has to feel where the peas are. She has to go over and count the steps with her body of where the skateboard is, and it's here, and I'm going to jump on it here, and then do my foot, go out the front door, and the steps here. Then she did it with a bandana around her eyes. Oh, good. To where she could take the bandana off at any time, and she ate jumped on the skateboard with the bandana, did the jump with the bandana, and then they go, is everybody ready? Oh my God. Then they put the head on, two minutes of oxygen, and they start the, they start the cameras rolling first, they screw it on, you know, like 20,000 leagues under the sea, Kirk <laughs> Douglas, you know, hello, you're here, and it has motors in there that make the eyes go, and goes, hey, how's it And she's like, eats, then she gets up, has to jump on the skateboard, out the front door, has to go down with the head on, up on and then as soon as she gets to the bottom and she stuck the skateboard she gets to the bottom and then she jumps off and they are unscrewing that thing <gasps> how many takes did you have to do like that not that many no i wouldn't think no. so no but but i mean they're brilliant brilliant people that worked on that movie that that do amazing things the the people who made the bears were brilliant you right. know it just turned out that we opened the same day austin powers did Gold member and yeah, they got all them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Business. Yeah. It was sad. But you're right. There are those experiences Brilliant that, and you all carried the experience my whole life. From a technical standpoint, also that you're mm -hmm. sort of in awe of these people and what they do. Amazing. Um, you're going to have to come back because I'm starting to feel bad keeping you here going on two hours. Oh. Uh, <sighs> there's so much more to talk about. But people should tune in. Let's tell them. We've been running lower thirds to tell people where they can find you, your at name on the Twitter, as well as where they can get the um, Stephen Tobolowsky uh, birthday party. Yeah, that's stbpmovie.com. Right. And, and the files are at tobolowskyfiles.com. On iTunes. Uh, yeah, it's on iTunes and 
different places. Yeah. That's for the podcast. Yeah. Um, I We didn't get to the Woody Allen, and we didn't go far enough into the Chris Nolan, but clearly these were amazing experiences for you. Yeah. And um, you've got so many more ahead of you. I can't wait to, to, to follow along as such a fan. I hope. And so very, very grateful that you like made. Like I say, I'm, I'm just living for that next moment. Yeah. I love it. Well, thanks for sharing these Thank you. moments with us. Thank you, sir. Honestly. And congratulations on your big win today in Who Tweeted. You know, I'm going to spend this $20. <laughs> Don't on give it to a monk. Whore. <laughs> Whatever you do, do not give it to a monk. <laughs> it's way too much for them. No. They don't know how to deal with it. They'll beat you senseless. Um, honestly, thank you, truly. My pleasure. Uh, now, if you wouldn't mind sitting there uncomfortably uh, while I wrap up to the fine folks at home, uh, oh, they're reminding me that I almost let you off the hook with the, your, your Larry King game. Ah, you were happy about that, weren't you? <laughs> I've done this now a few weeks in a row, and they're yelling at me saying, you, you've got to stop. This is a long-standing tradition. Okay. okay, let's go over the rules again. Bad Larry King impression, okay. so no pressure. Okay, no pressure. There. I want that's, an awful one. If it's good, I'm going to be angry. No, it's, okay. I'm not good at impressions. And then there's that moment where Larry shares something about himself. That, yeah, 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 we don't want to know. And then you just go to the phones, and the name of the city should be funny sounding. Okay. That, that's it. Okay. There's your camera. When you're ready... Okay, I can't do the hunchback. You don't either. have, it okay. would, whatever comes through. Uh, 1958, I was a cub reporter for sports column, went to the Dallas Spurs 2A team, went to see Juan Tuggerson. He was a, a left-hander, fired heat all the time, and he asked me if I was a hanger or a packer. <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about because that phrase was not familiar with underwear at that time. Ah, uh, Kinkakee, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're talking about, no, my on. friend. Thank you. That was fantastic. Oh, God. That's going on the reel. No. Yes, <laughs> that's a keeper. Uh, all right, now you can sit there uncomfortably while I wrap Please. things up for the folks at home. Thank you so much to my guest today. One of the all-time greats, and uh, so very, very thrilled that he finally was able to uh, come by and and share some of his true life stories, every syllable of the truth, and yet so very outrageous. What a treat. Um, throughout the last uh, hour, 55 minutes, Mike, the majority of the crew anyways, have been outside these hollow walls. I want to give thanks to the crew before we uh, try to go to some, uh, some videotape of what they've been up to. I realize that so many people are doing the audio uh, download and listening to the show and they don't see the credit roll at the end of the show. And then there's no audio version of who I have to thank each and every damn week. Here we are, 114 uh, interviews into this thing. Today was 114. So in the room, of course, you've got uh, Sam the Man Levine. You've got, of course, uh, <laughs> Jamie Foxx and Dr. Chen. On the outside, you've heard these names. Uh, Josh Negrin, one of our producers. Emily Goodwin, one of our producers. Jay Mack or Jason McIntyre. One of our producers, our director, Mike Rotman. Head of social media, Lane Ewing, stopped by earlier. Love Jennifer Zied on makeup. Who am I leaving out? I'm sure I'm forgetting someone. I think I did all right this time. All right. Well, I want to thank all of them, and we'll try to do so from now on, because I, this actually dawned on me. And it only took two years and two months for me to realize something was wrong. All right. So now I wonder, what has the crew been up to? The last hour, 56 minutes. If only there was some sort of video evidence and sound. You know what I do. Oh, God. You, you always want to sing every time, okay? Just, I'm trying to do a show. It's like, we're not doing Glee here. Go, go sing a J-Mac. Hey, J-Mac. No, 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 no. Life is not a musical. No. If you want to sing, go sing outside. Sing outside. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> no. That is fantastic. It seems so unfair that she finally got her moment in the sun and somehow she would blow it up. You know what? <laughs> you know what I think that is? I think it was the rapture. It was the rapture? I think it was the rapture. Oh my goodness. She got raptured. She didn't have to wait till no, she went to a better place. But she was taken. She was, uh, I'm saying it's good. By it's a good Lord. thing that, that Somehow J Mac was not uh, Wiley e. Coyote this time. I don't know. That's oh, poor that's Emily. That's how they threw you off. That's how they threw exactly. They figured we were like, on oh, to them. Get it. A great job 